2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 11. And the title of our sermon is Faith-Filled Giving. Faith-Filled Giving. And we are nearing the end of two chapters in the Bible dealing with the subject of Christian generosity or Christian giving. Chapter 8 and chapter 9 written to the church in Corinth concerning a collection for poor and suffering saints in the Jerusalem church. That's in this context, in the context of these two chapters, in the context of this collection for the saints in Jerusalem, that we've been given clear and helpful instruction for how those who name the name of the Lord Jesus Christ should give. This is a systematic theology, if you will, of Christian giving. We're not talking here about giving our time. Though Christians should give their time, right? We're not talking here about giving of our talents and our gifts, though Christians should certainly serve employing their talents and their gifts. We're talking specifically here about giving money. That's what the text is dealing with, and so let's be clear about that. What we're talking about here is giving your money. In chapter 8, verses 1 through 6, we're given an example of how we should give in a way that honors the Lord. In chapter 8, verses 7 through 15, we're given an exhortation to give in a way that honors the Lord. And in chapter 8, verses 16 through chapter 9, verse 15, we're given an explanation for giving in a way that honors the Lord. So now in approaching our text this morning, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 11, we've learned several lessons as we've worked verse by verse through these two chapters. And I want to spend some time in the beginning here at the outset to remind us of some of those lessons. You may want to write this down, see if you can keep up. <laughs> what kind of giving is Paul after? What kind of giving is Paul after? What kind of giving should we be after? What kind of giving honors the Lord? One, grace giving that is grace-fueled. Giving that is grace-fueled. Chapter 8, verse 1, Moreover, brethren, we draw your attention to the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality, in a wealth of generosity. And Paul says, see that you abound in this grace also. Secondly, it's giving that is love motivated. Giving that is love motivated. Chapter 8, verse 8. Paul says, I speak not by commandment. But I am testing the sincerity of your love by the diligence of others. Thirdly, giving that is gospel-informed. Giving that is gospel-informed. Chapter 8, verse 9. Because you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. What kind of giving should we be motivated to give? What kind of generosity are we being called to? Next, it's giving that is God-glorifying. God-glorifying. Chapter 8, verse 19. This gift administered by us, Paul says, to the glory of the Lord himself. Next, it's giving that is testimony fortifying. Testimony fortifying. Chapter 8, verse 21. Providing honorable things... Not only in the sight of the Lord, certainly in his sight, but also in the sight of men that our boasting of you might not be in vain. Chapter 9, verse 3. And lastly, it's grace or giving that is faith-filled. Faith-filled. Chapter 9, verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. It is grace-fueled, love-motivated, gospel-informed, God-glorifying, testimony-fortifying, faith-filled giving. A lot. Amen? <laughs> when the people of God yielded to the Spirit of God, when they ready their minds, when they ready their hearts, when they prepare their hearts to give like this, then their giving will be, chapter 8, verse 2, overwhelmingly generous and sacrificial. Chapter 8, verse 3, unreservedly voluntary. Chapter 8, verse 4, seen as a blessing to the giver, and certainly a blessing to the receiver. Chapter 8, verse 5, an expression of selfless devotion. Chapter 8, verse 6, the fruit of an abounding grace. Chapter 8, verse 8, the demonstration of a sincere love. Chapter 8, verse 9, an expression of gratitude for Christ. 
Chapter 8, verse 10, to our everlasting advantage, Paul says. Right? Chapter 8, verse 12, the action of a willing mind, a willing heart. Chapter 8, verse 12, according to your means. According to your means. Chapter 8, verse 14, a means through which God works to meet the needs of his people. Chapter 8, verse 21, honorable in the sight of God. Chapter 8, verse 21, honorable in the sight of men. Chapter 8, verse 24, the proof or evidence of your love. Chapter 9, verse 2, a means by which others are stirred up to give. Chapter 9, verse 2, a cause for boasting on your behalf. Chapter 9, verse 5, an act of gracious generosity. Chapter 9, verse 6, that cause and spring of a bountiful blessing from God who supplies all that we need when we trust Him in our giving. We're not even done with chapter 9 yet, right? We've got another week to go, Lord willing. Beloved, this is how we need to give. We need to grasp these two chapters from God's Word, and this is how we need to give. This is the mindset that we need to inform our giving. This is the heart with which we should come to the worship of God through giving. This is how we give in the church. This is how we give as Christians. Amen? We need to be informed by these two chapters. We're called to abound in this grace. And someone might say, well, listen, if I give like this, I'm not going to have anything left over. Well, slow down, cowboy. <laughs> We give according to our means, chapter 8, verse 12. Listen, I'm not gifted in generosity. It's not my gift. <laughs> Prepare your heart, brother. Prepare your heart, sister. Giving shouldn't be a grudging obligation, chapter 9, verse 5. For you older men, you older men raising kids, providing for your household, plan and prepare your giving. Let your zeal for giving to the Lord's work, to the cause of Christ, in this way, what's being described here, let it stir up the majority and be an example of sacrificial love. Let your zeal, men, fire up the majority. Young man, young man working a part-time job, trying to get yourself through school. Not a lot left over at the end of that stack of bills, Right? Let this good work be a fruit of your faith and begin a habit now of sowing bountifully and reaping bountifully. Young lady, purposing in your heart to be devoted to the Lord and satisfied in Him alone. Mix your giving with tears of gratitude for what the Lord has done in Christ for you and lay up for yourself, dear sister, treasure in heaven. Amen? I'm going to refrain from older ladies. <laughs> no, I'm not. You sisters, I love you, older ladies. <laughs> Acknowledge that everything you have, everything that you've been given, comes from Him alone. And give as a testimony to young sisters. Give as a testimony to young men. Give as a testimony to those who are, are tempted to draw back in faithlessness and fear. Give as a testimony to them that He is faithful to supply all your needs and He always has. Now, that kind of giving takes faith. Now, that kind of giving takes faith. Our giving should be faith-filled giving. Faith-filled giving. Now, how do we give in faith? How do we give in faith? Well, that's the subject of our text this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 to 11. What does it look like to give in faith? How do we give in faith? How is it that our giving is faith-filled? Let's look first at the premise in a proverb in verse 6. The premise in a proverb. Paul begins in verse 6 saying this, But this I say. Right? The word but makes it sound like he's introducing a contrast with what came before. It's not really a contrast. It's a continuation of what was said before. Verse 5, make sure your gift is a matter of generosity and not a grudging obligation. Then the Greek literally says in verse 6, now this. Right now this. Make sure your giving is a matter of generosity and not a grudging obligation. Now this. And he introduces a proverb in verse 6. Now this. 
He's giving us a principle or a proverb that should motivate us to generous giving. Here it is. He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So we have the premise in a proverb. Verse 6 is a tale of two farmers sowing seed in a field. Now remember here what we're talking about. We're talking about giving money, right? We're talking about giving money. This is a tale of two farmers sowing seed in a field. One farmer goes into the field with a handful of seeds that are precious to him, right? He's got a handful of seeds. Those seeds are precious, right? He sows them fedamenos, sparingly. He sows them in a meager way, reluctantly, putting each individual seed. He inserts it in the dirt, in the dirt like slipping a diamond into a vault, right? Covers it over, cares for it, each seed individually. There's no indication that he has any fewer seeds than the other farmer, but he's most concerned about conserving his seed because he has ultimately no confidence in the harvest. Do you see? He's fearful. He's fearful. And he, sow, he sows sparingly. The other farmer goes into the field with two big seed bags on his shoulders, right? The field has been well plowed, well prepared. And as he walks through the field, he reaches big handful into one bag and tosses it out to the right. Big hand in the other bag and tosses it out to the left, casting seed on either side as he goes, right? Grabbing a handful of seed, sowing eulagia. The preposition there, with the preposition, it literally means on the basis of blessing. He sows bountifully. And what the word is conveying is that he sows on the basis of blessing. Okay? In other words, he sows generously, liberally, with an expectation a future eye, so to speak, faith in a blessing. Not concerned so much with conserving the seed as he is with reaping the harvest. Now, what initially distinguishes the two farmers on the surface is the amount of seed that they sow. One sows sparingly, one sows bountifully. However, what is revealed in the amount of seed that they sow is their heart attitude Toward the harvest, isn't it? In our metaphor, just we have this straight. In our metaphor, what is the seed referring to? Money. That's right. I heard it. <laughs> That's right. Money, right? What is the sowing referring to? Giving. It's referring to giving. And what is it that the farmers will reap then? Blessing. That's right. That's right. The seed is referring to money. The sowing is referring to giving. What is it the farmers will reap? The farmers will reap a blessing. Now, we're establishing the principle here with this proverb. We're establishing the principle of giving in faith. A giving in faith, right? One farmer fears the loss of his seed. As long as he has seed in the barn, the farmer feels secure. To scatter it around. To scatter it around like that seems to him to be wasteful rather than helpful. Do you see? As the seed leaves his hand, it seems to him that there is a decrease in what he has. He's letting it go, and what he has seems to decrease to him. He fears there won't be a harvest, or that he'll have little or no return for his sowing. Maybe... His surplus will be depleted. There won't be anything left for him. He's sowing in fear. Besides all that, he has his hand on the seed now. It's his. There's seed in the barn. There's seed in the bag. There's seed in his hand. And it's his to let it go. Well, listen, there's just no, there are no guarantees. There are no guarantees. So why should I let it go liberally? I need to conserve it. So he hoards his seed and he sows sparingly. He sows miserly. He sows reluctantly, not in hope, not in joy, but in fear, in reluctance. He sows begrudgingly, to use that word from verse 5, right? The other farmer doesn't fear the loss of the seed. He sees the seed as a means to the harvest, right? The seed in the barn isn't the blessing or the security that this farmer is after. In fact, it seems really foolish to him to keep seed in the barn. 
That's not what seed is for. What in the world is seed for if not to sow an expectation of a harvest? That's the mind, the heart of this farmer. As the seed leaves his hand, there is every expectation that what he has is not decreasing, but increasing. Right? He'll replenish his seed at the harvest. There's no need to worry about that. And so he sows bountifully, and he sows in hope, and in joy, and in faith, and he sows generously, liberally, right? So in stark contrast to worldly wisdom, this little proverb is biblically axiomatic. It's a truism from Scripture. It's all over Scripture. The means to true prosperity in this life is not the covetous accumulation of money, but the faith-filled generosity that gives it away. I want to repeat that, and I want us to think. Let that sink, sink into your heart and mind. In stark contrast to worldly wisdom, the means to true prosperity in this life, in this life, is not the covetous accumulation of money, but the faith-filled generosity that gives it away. Those words are chosen carefully because it is faith-filled giving that secures that prosperity for God's people. Okay? It's Christian giving in faith. And you might say, yeah, I know, I know. I believe what the Bible says. I know there's going to be a blessing for me in heaven when I give. I believe the Lord will take care of me on this side of eternity. But I know that I'm, I'm really, I'm storing up a treasure for myself in heaven. I understand that. Now listen. That's certainly true. Amen. That's a promise from God. But the proverb refers to what we sow and reap in this life also. It's in this life, here and now. This life and the one to come. Okay? Wicked, word of faith, false teachers have robbed many of God's people from this precious precious promise from his word. Right? There's a promise in God's word regarding this. And don't let wicked, deplorable, covetous, greedy, false teachers from a word of faith movement, those charismatics, don't let them rob the joy of this promise from God's people. There is a promise to God's people with respect to your giving. Okay? Let's remind ourselves of some of them. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. These are promises to God's people. Okay? We have a promise here in our text regarding this, but certainly we find it all over the Bible. Proverbs chapter 3, and look at verse 9. Here in chapter 3, verse 9, the Lord says, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. What comes to you? You give first back to the Lord, right? Honor the Lord with your possessions, what he gives you, and with the first fruits of what comes to you, of what's given to you. So that, verse 10, your heavenly barns will be filled with, no, your barns, okay? So that your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Flip the page to the right, look at Proverbs 11. Proverbs 11 Look there, Proverbs 11 at verse 24. Now, these are, these are promises in this life. Forgiving and blessing in the here and now. Verse 24, there's one who scatters, and even though he scatters, what? He increases more. That's that farmer as he's casting out seed. As the seed is leaving his hand, he sees an increase, right? He sees a harvest. He's not seeing it as a decrease, as a loss of what he has, but as an increase, okay? There's one who scatters and yet increases more. There's one who withholds more than is right, but it leads to poverty. And why is that? It's true because God is, in the, is the one who's sovereign over giving and receiving, right? God is the one who is sovereign over all these things. Verse 25, the generous soul will be made rich. It's passive. Who's the one making him rich? God is. 
The generous soul will be made rich. He who waters will also be watered himself. The people will curse him who withholds grain, but blessing will be on the head of him who sells it. He who earnestly seeks good finds favor, but trouble will come to him who seeks evil. He who trusts in his riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like foliage, like a crop. (laughs) Okay, put the page and look at Proverbs chapter 19. Proverbs chapter 19. And look there at verse 17. Where the Lord says, he who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord. That's an interesting statement. Let that one sink in for a moment, right? He who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord and he, who's the he? Who's the nearest antecedent of the he? The Lord. The Lord will pay back what he has given. He who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord. When you give, it's as if the proverb is saying you are lending to the Lord. Who pays you back when you lend? The Lord does. And he will pay back what he has given. Proverbs chapter 28. Proverbs chapter 28. And look at verse 27. Chapter 28, verse 27. He who gives to the poor will not lack, but he who hides his eyes from the poor will have many curses. One more. Malachi. We get Malachi. Last book in your Old Testament. Malachi. And look at chapter 3. Beginning in verse 8. Malachi chapter 3. Beginning in verse 8. Where the Lord asks a question. Verse 8, will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. This passage is applicable. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? You've robbed me, God says, in tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, and see if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground. Nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Those blessings belong to us too. Amen? They belong to us too. In addition to all those blessings found forgiving in the New Testament. Now notice... Back in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, our proverb, in our proverb, and in each of these passages that we've read, who is the one who gives the increase? God does. Who's the one who gives the supply? God does. Who's the one who gives the increase? God does. Who's the one who gives the blessing? God does. Calvin said this, whenever carnal reason... Whenever worldly reasoning, right, worldly wisdom, whenever carnal reason keeps us back from doing good through fear of loss, we may immediately defend ourselves with this shield. But the Lord declares that we are sowing. Everybody understand what Calvin's saying? Right? When you're tempted to draw back, when you're tempted to fear, when you find your heart faithless, And particularly with respect to this subject of Christian giving, when that carnal reason, that worldly mindset keeps us back from doing good by using fear of loss as a wicked tool against you, and you feel, feel that sense, that fear of loss arising in your heart, we can immediately defend ourselves with this retort. The Lord declares that I am sowing. And if I am sowing He says there will be a what? 
a harvest. There'll be a harvest. I'm sowing. It leaves my hand. It's not decreasing. It's increasing. It leaves my hand. It's not loss. It's gain. It's increase, right? We're to sow with our faith in him for the harvest. All our, our obedience should be the same. Amen? All of our obedience to God should be from the same basis of faith in him. This is the Christian life. Believing that what he has commanded is for my good. It's for my edification. It's for my conformity to my Savior. Right? The Lord is growing me, making me a, a chaste virgin to present before Christ holy, without spot or blemish. Right? He's sanctifying us. And as he sanctifies us, I am to obey him in faith. Understanding that these things are for my good. So when you consider giving then to the church, when you consider your giving to missions, when you consider your giving to the needs of God's people, let your giving be fueled by God's grace, informed by the gospel, motivated by love, and filled with faith. And consider God's promise to you in the proverb. Consider God's promise in verse 6. What kind of harvest... Do you, by faith, intend to reap? Prepare your heart ahead of time. What kind of harvest do I want to reap for the Lord's sake, for the Lord's glory, for the good of his people, for the good of his church, for the good of his cause, right, for the sake of his name, for the spread of the gospel? What kind of harvest do I, by faith, intend to reap? A meager harvest or a bountiful harvest? Listen, Lord. I knew that you were an austere master, that you were tough, right? And so I took what you gave me, and I buried it there in the dirt. The Lord comes back. See, Lord, here you have back what you gave me. What happens to that faithless and wicked servant? What kind of harvest? A meager harvest? A bountiful harvest? Giving, our giving is an act of faith. Our discipleship is an act of faith. Sometimes it doesn't go so good, right? Uh, and maybe you're having conflicts and difficulties. Maybe you're not seeing much fruit. Well, listen, brother, you're sowing. So what do you do? You keep sowing. But that one left the church, and that one got mad at me, and that one won't talk to me anymore. Listen. <laughs> Think about what you're doing. Uh, make sure you're being loving. Make sure you're being wise in your discipleship. But you're sowing. So keep sowing. What kind of harvest do you expect to reap? A great harvest. That's faith. That's faith. We should sow in hope, sow in faith. Think about your evangelism, right? Sometimes it's tough. And you're going door to door. You don't see fruit for a while, right? You're not getting the responses maybe that you'd like to see. I just haven't had a good conversation in a while. Not seeing the fruit that I'd like to see. Well, of course not. We would like to see a great awakening, <laughs> right? And the Lord may do that. But short of the Lord doing that, we are sowing, brother. We're sowing, sister. And we will reap a harvest. Why? Because God has said so. So in faith, I go to the door with the expectation of faith that I will reap a harvest if I faint not, <laughs> right? Don't grow weary in well-doing, right? Don't be discouraged in your souls, Faith, preach the gospel, love your brothers, serve in the church. What about serving over with the kids? <laughs> How many diapers have I changed in here? I don't, I don't know. I, I can't remember. I've lost count. <laughs> you are serving and sowing. You're sowing. What kind of harvest do you, by faith, intend to reap? Is it going to be a meager harvest because of your heart? A meager harvest because of the, the way that you approach your service. The way that you approach. It's not about the amount. Do you see? It's not about the amount. It's about our heart. The way that I approach my evangelism. The way that I approach my discipleship. The way that I approach serving. The way that I approach my brothers and sisters in the church coming here. Right? The way that I approach my giving. What is my heart attitude? Is it God-glorifying, love-motivated, testimony-fortified, gospel-informed Faith-filled giving, service, evangelism, discipleship? Or is it begrudging, 
Is it meager? Is it scant? Is it reluctant? Our giving is to be faith-filled giving. That brings us to our second point. Giving then from faith. We have our premise in a proverb. Chapter uh, 9, verse 6. And then Paul launches into instruction with, resp- with respect to giving then from faith in verse 7. He says in verse 7, So then, now considering our proverb, let then each one give as he purposes in his heart. Literally, it says, let each one choose for himself. That's what the text says. Let him choose for himself. This is an individual responsibility between you and God as a matter of your faith. It's a matter of your faith. You have an individual responsibility. We give, we have much work that we do here corporately as a church. But giving is a matter for you to consider individually between you and God. Let each one choose for himself. Considering the points that have been raised, considering the instruction that has been given to us from the Word of God, how are you going to give? Now, Paul has great confidence that all the instruction, the example of the Macedonians, the example of the Lord Jesus Christ, all the instruction that's been given to us about giving, Paul has great confidence that the Christian has a willing heart, a willing mind, And that with that willing mind, with that willing heart, fueled by grace, indwelt by the Spirit, that Christian is going to give and going to give generously in a way that honors the Lord, in a way that's God-glorifying. Unless that one doesn't have the right heart, doesn't have the right mind, right? Check your heart. Inform your heart. Prepare your heart. Consider what has been said. How are you going to give? Certainly here with respect to money. But with any act of Christian obedience, right? How are you going to approach our responsibility for evangelism, for discipleship, for loving your brother, loving your sister, for ministering to your spouse, ladies, for submitting to your husband, men, for sacrificially loving your wife, children, for obeying your parents? How are we going to serve Cornerstone Kids? How are we going to serve at the events that we have around here? There's a missions work that our church is involved in in Haiti, right? There's work that our church is involved in in Guatemala City. How are we going to give? How are we going to manage these things? What is the heart attitude with which we will, before God, in the sight of God, approach these things? Let each one give here as he purposes in his heart. Not grudgingly, nor of necessity. Why? Because God loves a cheerful giver. Word cheerful, hilaros. It's where we get our word hilarious from. That doesn't mean that you're a hilarious giver in the way that we conceive of that word. That word. Now you, there are some YouTube videos where you see some hilarious giving. Uh, it's also uh, oftentimes blasphemous giving, right, in the way that they go about that. You've been in some of those, those churches. We're to be joyful, joyful, exuberant, exuberant. When it leaves my hand, what do I see in faith? A harvest. And there's joy over that, Right. You know, big handfuls of seed. <laughs> like, why? Because we're we're sowing in faith. We're sowing in faith, not grudgingly, or of necessity, but joyfully. Word for grudging is different than that word begrudging in verse five. It's a different word. It literally means with sorrow or with grief, because it's a cheerful or a joyful giver. That's the giver that God loves. That's the giver that God loves, the one who gives in joy. The emphasis here is not on the amount. What is he emphasizing? He's emphasizing the attitude of your heart when you give. If you give in sorrow, you're giving begrudgingly. Let me ask you this. If God loves the cheerful giver, what's his attitude toward the begrudging, sorrowful giver? God loathes the begrudging giver. God loves the cheerful giver. God loathes the begrudging giver. Okay? The emphasis here is on the attitude of heart. Remember the Macedonians from chapter 8, verse 2. They gave out of an abundance of their joy. Out of deep poverty and out of an abundance of joy they gave. They begged for the blessing of participating in this collection. Right? It shows their heart. And by stating positively that God loves the joyful giver... 
The implication is that God loathes the begrudging giver. This is not to be done out of necessity. Well, let's take an aside with respect to that for just a moment. Right? It's not to be done as a necessity. But you might ask, aren't we commanded to give? Aren't we commanded to give? Yes, we are. Yes, we are commanded to give. It's a command in Scripture. Well, that makes it necessary, doesn't it? Yes, it does. It makes it necessary. But we need to watch our hearts. It is to be faith-filled giving. Let me read a couple of texts to you. Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 7. Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 7. You shall not harden your heart, nor shut your hand from your poor brother, but you shall open your hand wide to him and willingly lend him sufficient for his need, whatever he needs. That's a command from Scripture. Romans chapter 12, verse 13. We are to distribute to the needs of the saints. We are to distribute to the needs of the saints. Command from Romans chapter 12, verse 13. The tithe. Giving a tenth of all that is given to us was codified under the old covenant and upheld under the new. Giving the tithe was present before the old covenant, was codified under the old covenant, and is upheld under the new, still in action today, so to speak. And interesting, turn with me to Matthew chapter 23. Let me show a text to you with respect to this. Matthew chapter 23. A New Testament text dealing specifically with the tithe. Matthew chapter 23. And look there at verse 23. Now the Lord is rebuking just a scourging here of the Pharisees with respect to their hypocrisy. Specifically here in verse 23, their hypocrisy when it comes to the tithe. Look at what he says in verse 23. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. Why? Because you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faith. These you ought to have done, tithing of mint, anise and cumin, tithing, without leaving the others undone. Now think with me about what's going on here in Matthew 23. The Lord is rebuking scribes and Pharisees for hypocritical tithing, for their hypocrisy, right? Their giving, their tithing has deteriorated into a heartless practice that is disconnected entirely from the important matters that the tithe was intended to support or to promote. You see what's going on? He's rebuking them because their giving has been disconnected. It's turned into a heartless, hypocritical thing because it's been disconnected from the heart of what the command to tithe was given to promote or to support, okay? Which is God's justice, God's mercy, and faith in the Lord. What they've done in their hypocrisy is they're tithing, but they're tithing in a disconnected way which makes it hypocritical in a disconnected way from God's mercy, from God's justice, and from faith in Him. They devoted a tenth of every herb in their garden, but what's the one thing that wasn't devoted to the Lord? Their heart. They were giving a tenth of everything else, but what's the one thing they lacked? They didn't give their devotion, their heart, their affections. They didn't give of themselves to the Lord. So their giving then was actually a blasphemous and hypocritical lack of Christian generosity, right? Their giving was hypocritical. He concludes that explanation by saying this, these you ought to have done. You ought to have given these, but you should have given them in this way. Do you see? You should have given them in this way without leaving the others undone. Now, what is that telling us? about the law. I think with me, the Lord is after something far more radical than a mere external conformity to the law, than a mere moralism. He's after something far more radical than mere formalism or mere moralism. The Lord is after your heart. 
and your devotion and your love and your affection and your faith and trust in Him. That's what the Lord is after. We're not to disconnect these two things, right? Give in that way. The Lord is after far something far more radical than a mere 10% of your income. Right? That's the law. That's the law. But he's after something far more radical than just your external conformity to the law. Okay? John Calvin said this. Listen. The principal end and use of the law is to invite men to God. I like that. The principal end and use of the law is to invite men to God. He also said this. Free affection is the foundation and beginning of duly obeying the law. For what is drawn forth by constraint or servile fear cannot please God. So if you give, and you give in fear, without faith, it's hypocrisy. Can amount to that of the Pharisees, right? Disconnected from love, from faith, from justice and mercy. There can be no true holiness of heart or life unless it proceeds from faith working by love. Do you see? No true holiness of heart or life unless it proceeds from faith working by love. It's true of all of our obedience, isn't it? It's true of all of our obedience. We must give from faith working by love. So the Christian says to that, yes, <laughs> and amen. Praise the Lord. That's the response of the Christian. That's the way I want to give, right? I want to have that heart. God, I... I I know how weak and how prone to wander my heart is, but I see this example of your grace at work in the Macedonians. God, give me a double portion. Right? Let that mantle fall upon me. That's the way I want to give. I love you, Lord. I want to give as you have called me to give. I give. I see that my giving should be grace-fueled, love-motivated, gospel-informed, God-glorifying, testimony-fortifying, Christ-exalting, and faith-filled. I want to give that way. I know that what should motivate that giving is faith working through love. Help me, Lord. <laughs> right? The free affection of my heart in devotion to Him. That's how I'm to give. Lord, my heart is plagued with fears. My heart is plagued with fears on one side, doubt on the other. I worry about not having enough. I worry about what happens. If things get tight, or I lose my job, or if I can't work any longer, I, I don't want to be unwise in my giving, Lord. I don't want to be unwise. I'm concerned about my responsibilities to my family, to my household. I'm, resp I'm concerned about making sure there's enough there that I can provide for my household. I'm aware of your command, Lord, my responsibility that I should do that. I recognize, though, within my heart, there is a tendency toward self-indulgence. There's a tendency toward faithlessness in the way that I hoard my possessions or my money. It's a tendency toward selfishness. Sometimes, Lord, I have a greater desire for my own comfort than a desire to provide for the needs of my brothers and sisters. Paul answers those doubts and concerns. He answers them. And he says, have faith, brother. Have faith, sister. Listen, beloved, have faith. Verse 8, God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. Now here's the Apostle Paul. The Holy Spirit, through the pen of Paul, coming alongside you, me, in our doubts and in our weakness and in our ear with great love and great affection, great mercy and grace from God saying, have faith, have faith. God's able to take care of you. Look at the lilies of the field. They neither toil nor weep, nor worry, nor doubt, nor fear. <laughs> Yet the Lord takes care. Look how majestically they are arrayed. 
God is able. Five times he uses a variation here of the word all. <laughs> all grace, always having, all sufficiency, and all things may have an abundance for all good work. <laughs> That's what he's saying. What all that means is that you can be freely generous. Be freely generous, free from worry, free from that concern, free from doubt. Have faith. Take a deep breath, right? Take a deep breath and trust the Lord. Trust the Lord. You can give. You can give. And He is able. He is able to make all grace abound toward you. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Now to Him who is able. That's where we see that phrase. Right? Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. The Lord was able to take your heart of stone and replace it with a heart of flesh, wasn't he? The Lord was able to change your desires. Couldn't have done that yourself. You're in Christ. He has transformed you, transformed the way that you think. He's transformed your affections. He's transformed your hopes. Right? He's transformed your heart. He was able to change your desires. He was able to take your punishment. He was able to die there in your place to forgive you of your sins. He was able to break the pattern of rebellion that was bound up in your rebellious heart. Was he not? He was able to impute to you his righteousness to give you an inheritance with the saints in the light. He is able, as Jude says, to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Listen, if he's able to do that, then he is able to make all grace abound toward you. That you always having all sufficiency in all things may have an abundance for every good work. I don't know the fullness and extent of my own wicked heart. Neither do you. The Lord does. The Lord does. And the Lord is able to sustain. I know enough about my own heart to know what a miracle of grace it is. That God will sustain me to the end and present me faultless. I know what a miracle that is. And if God can do that, then he is able to do anything to preserve me and care for me and supply my need on this side of eternity. To God, our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever, as Jude says, amen. Right? He's able. He's provided for you all your life to this point, hasn't he? He's provided for you all your life to this point. He can take a miser and turn him into a generous giver. He can certainly uh, make all grace abound toward us. In fact, in fact, his faithfulness as provider is memorialized in a psalm. Psalm 112 Verse 9, it's quoted in verse 9 of 2 Corinthians chapter 9. As it is written, he has dispersed abroad. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now, the subject of this statement, the subject of this statement is the person who gives. Now listen to that with me one more time and think of it with respect to that. The subject of the statement is the person who gives in faith. As it is written, verse 9, he has dispersed abroad. He's given. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. And that's an amazing thought, isn't it? What a, an amazing thought of grace and mercy on the part of God toward the one who gives in faith. The one who puts their faith in the Lord gives as God has called them to give. And that person has God's blessing. In addition to having all sufficiency in all things, in addition to having God's promised abundance for every good work, your faithful and righteous acts of generous giving endure before the sight of God forever. Forever. 
so that you can sit back with your thumbs under your overall straps and say, look at how generous I was. <laughs> no. They're a testimony of God's grace. They're a testimony of God's spirit at work in the heart of his people to give generously. It's a testimony of him. And that testimony, that testimony of righteousness will endure forever, forever, both in the life that now is and in the life which is to come. A treasure that will not fade, a treasure that neither moth nor rust can destroy, a treasure that thieves can never break in and steal. The beauty of that righteous giving, that act of righteousness, never fades in the sight of God. So, brother and sister, trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. Faith-filled giving. We have the premise in a proverb. We can give from faith because, point three on your notes, giving, the giving of God. Because of the giving of God. Paul ends with a prayer to God for them, for the Corinthians, and for us. This prayer is for us also. Verse 10. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower. Remember our parable, our proverb, right? Remember our metaphor. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food. Supply and multiply the seed that you have sown. And increase the fruits of your righteousness. Now we often... Imagine, don't we, that it's our sowing that produces the harvest. We lose sight of the fact that it's God who produces the harvest. And we think that it's our own effort, our sowing, that produces the harvest. And so we sweat and we toil and we worry over that thing as if it's up to us. And listen, if it was up to us, it would fail far more than succeed. It's not up to us. It's God who does that. We often think that our diligence, our work, our labor, the might of our hand have provided us this wealth. We often think that way. But notice the three parts that we see in verse 10. He will supply. He's the one who supplies, right? He will multiply and he will increase. He supplies the seed. What is the seed? It's the means of doing good. Specifically from our proverb, it's money, it's wealth, it's, it's what we have. It's our resources given to us by God, right? He supplies the seed, which is the means of doing good. He provides for you bread for food. He's going to give you enough for you, and he's going to give you enough to sow seed. Right? The Lord gives that. All that we have, the Lord gives us. He multiplies that seed that is sown. In other words, he makes it effective. Isn't that a glorious thought, too? When I sow seed, I can sow one tiny seed, and from that spring, 50 stalks of grain, right? He multiplies the seed. He makes it effective in a way that we never could, in a way that is miraculous, right? Supernaturally, he multiplies the seed that is sown, making it effective, and he increases the fruit, the fruit of well-doing, the fruits of your righteousness. Listen to this from Deuteronomy chapter 8. Deuteronomy chapter 8, beginning in verse 11, where Moses says, Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, his judgments, and his statutes, which I command you today. Don't forget him. Lest, when you have eaten and are full and have built beautiful houses and dwell in them, and when your herds and your flocks multiply... And your silver and your gold are multiplied. And all that you have is multiplied. Why? Because of the good hand of God. The gracious giving of God. The supply of God. When all that is multiplied. When your heart is lifted up. And you forget the Lord your God. Who brought you out of the land of Egypt. You forget that all those blessings have come from him. From the house of bondage, who led you through that great and terrible wilderness in which were fiery serpents and scorpions and thirsty land where there was no water. Who brought water for you out of the flinty rock. If the Lord wants to bring supply for you from a rock, he is able. (laughs) Amen? Who fed you in the wilderness with manna. If the Lord wants to drop supply from you straight out of heaven... Like a pastry on the ground that you can pick up, he can do it. Amen? He's able. Right? 
which your fathers didn't know, that he might humble you and that he might test you to do you good in the end. Then you say in your heart, what a testimony of the depravity of our wicked hearts, the self-sufficiency, the faithlessness for us to say, my power and the might of my hand have gained me this wealth. Absurd, isn't it? That would be like, terrible analogy, uh, your three-year-old walking into the kitchen can hardly even put a coherent sentence together, pulls open the refrigerator and pulls out their gummies uh, and says, my might and the pow power of my hand... <laughs> Have made for me, it's, it's infinitely more absurd than that. Is it for God's people to say, listen, you didn't make you. I stand here having been made fearfully and wonderfully so. I reap the blessings and the benefits of his gracious Hand to me. Take a breath. Feel that air rushing into your lungs? Where does that come from? God graciously gives it. For me to say, my power and the might of my hand have gained me this wealth, may it never be so. Right? That's what the lost world says, not the people of God. Let's not act like that is our heart. Have faith, brother. Have faith, sister. It goes on, you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers, as it is this day. Then it shall be, if you by any means forget the Lord your God, and follow other gods, and serve them and worship them, including the God of yourself, I have provided this by my power and my might, I testify against you this day that you shall surely perish. And justifiably so. Amen? Paul, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 10, continues. Now, may he who supplies seed to the sower, bread for food, supply and multiply the seed you have sown, and increase the fr fruits of your righteousness. The implication of that last statement is this. What if you have no fruits of righteousness in this. Those that neglect this work are unrighteous. Those that neglect to sow the seed that God has given them for sowing are unrighteous. And he gives us all this, all this blessing, all this blessing, while, verse 11, you are enriched. It is present passive, ongoing, currently, you are enriched. Take a look, right? You are enriched liberally in all things. You are enriched in everything for liberality, for generosity. This is, brothers and sisters, our current state. Praise God for his many blessings. Praise God for his provision. Praise God for his supply. Praise God for his grace. Praise God for his mercy. And all of that, verse 11, causes thanksgiving through us to God. We're certainly grateful, aren't we, for what God has done for us. Amen. But also, when you obey in faith, when you give, as we're called to give, generously, liberally, it causes thanksgiving through us to God. It glorifies God. And all that due to the faithful giving of God's people. All praise, honor, and glory to the one who supplies all that we need to live for him. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Um, go before the Lord and Lord, ask the Lord, please, Lord, help us to have this heart. Give us faith and commit yourself to give in faith in a way that honors him. When you're done praying, you are dismissed. Let's pray.